Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Orchids are tropical plants with beautiful, unusual looking flowers. Today, we're going to talk about how to care for them. Also, not all bugs are bad. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis, and Tanya Ashworth will be joining me later. All right, Joellen. Beautiful orchids Beautiful here orchids. on the table, right? Yes. So how do we take care of orchids, right? Yeah, and, and, and uh, these are just store-bought orchids. Yeah. And they are all in their original containers right. that I got them in, which is probably not good. <laughs> okay, all right. But I have repotted this one in the same container. Uh, roots by nature like to, to come out of the I container. See. Um, because think about it, if sitting on the side of a tree in, in nature, and so the, the roots go everywhere because yeah. it mists, and so they're, they're out to get captured the mist okay. from the rainforest. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so that's why they're like that. All of these are Philanopsis, okay. which are the easiest to take care of and to grow. There, I have had some Cataleas, and they are more difficult. Okay. I've never gotten them to rebloom or do well inside. Okay. Uh, I had a greenhouse and they did real well in there. Okay. Uh, now you notice this one, I have them all sitting in an east facing window. Mm -hmm. This one gets more sun than these, these, and it blooms, this is the second time this year it has bloomed for me. It's beautiful bloom. And you can tell the foliage has got a little bit of problems. Uh, the yellowing here, yeah. well, it, it, and it's gotten too much sun. So I had to move it from its <laughs> east facing window and put it in a north facing window. East facing windows seem to be best okay. because they get some light, but it's not intense early in the morning. Got it. A western window would be a lot hotter and you probably get more of these yellow leaves because of that, it's too, too intense. Because they usually are in under a tree. Okay. They Makes like sense. bright light, but not direct sunlight. Not direct sunlight. Okay. So that's that's the key, and and you can't put them on your desk and just you know they can get, you can put them on your desk while they're blooming, but for just to keep them to get them to to live, you really need to set them close to a window, Got it. an east facing window, uh, is best. Is best. And so I, I have repotted this once, and this is its original can, container. But I will after it finishes blooming, is best time to repot. So when them. is it going to finish blooming? And this could take several weeks. So it takes a couple weeks. Okay. Oh, more like three or four weeks. Oh, good. Um, so it's it's beautiful. But you, one thing you do notice, the, the rim of it has a little white cast. I noticed that. It's beautiful. Well, it's not supposed to be that. In ah, fact, okay. I've noticed that it's gotten lighter and lighter, but. I'm not the best, you know how the plumber's house always leaks. Well, <laughs> okay. I don't fertilize them uh, when I should. Uh -huh. So I, this okay. is this this flower is telling me it could really the plant could really use some fertilizer uh -huh. that I'm not taking care of it as well. Okay. Even though it is still very pretty. It is pretty. So that's um, the indicator. I'm yeah, uh, it's it's supposed to be very very dark, uh, and so there's orchid fertilizer mm -hmm. that you use, mm -hmm. and. This is actually given okay. to me by my mother, <laughs> and I've never opened it. So it hadn't been opened. It's it looks like it hadn't been opened. It. So, mm. but the, I can tell you what you're supposed to do, it doesn't take much. Okay. They don't like a lot of fertilizer. So what, I'm, what you're supposed to do is take a gallon container, put a fourth of a teaspoon mm. of this fertilizer in it and dil dilute it, then water it with the fertilizer while it's blooming once every two weeks, and while it's in dormant and not blooming, once a month. Once a month. So okay. really, it's not a lot yeah, not of often. fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that these are all planted in this bark here, so it's not soil. Okay. So water just runs through it. 
you, this is the problem. People will uh, water it and then not let it drain out. Now wow. you'll notice this has got some, I just watered it yesterday. It's got some water in the bottom of it, but you notice this container goes up so it's not really sitting in mm -hmm. water and there's just drips in here. There's not much water in here at all. Uh, and this will dry out. It usually takes about a week for it to dry okay. out. Okay. And I usually, I'll take it to the sink just like this and have pour water from the faucet over it and just let it, you know, drip. Right. And then when I, when it feels just a little bit heavier because of the bark that is in there, then I, and these, these uh, turn green, bright green instead of this off green color, um, I let it drain out and then I put it back in this container and put it back in the window. So the container needs to stay there. Container needs to stay it here. Needs to stay there. Yeah, and you want it, you don't want uh, cuz this container has no holes in the bottom of it. Okay. There's no holes in the bottom Got of it. this. So you leave the insert in there cuz it does have holes in the bottom of it. it. So it so can it can okay. drain, but you don't leave it with water in it. You don't do that. Okay. okay. And so all of these are the same. And look, this one's starting to bloom again. And this one is starting to bloom again. Got it. Okay. These don't get as much light as that one. And these have only bloomed once a year for me. But it just gets enough. And the window that faces east also has a tree near it. So they're mm. not getting as much sunlight as this one's getting. Okay. But you see there it's in the original container. And I've just recently watered it too. Um, but it really needs to be repotted because all of these roots are coming up out of here because it's growing. And I really need to repot it and put it down into some bark. So that's how you know when yeah, to repot. Yeah, that's how you know right? to repot. It's when the, leaf, the, the roots start coming up out of the container. That means it's because the stem is growing. So it grows along the stem and the roots come out below it. Okay. And so that's when you know when the roots are all out of the pot, you know yeah. it's time to, to repot that. Okay. But I had to, I just haven't done this yet. Um, so would that go up to the next container? Yeah, so? I would just, I could, see I have this container here that I would like to repot some in. Um, I will probably put two of these in this container okay. eventually because there's, uh, there's, there's plenty of room in here and as small as these are, you don't need that much room. I don't, these are much smaller blooming Phalaenopsis than this one. Okay. So that's not gonna need as much room. Um, this one has never bloomed for me, so uh. I am taking it home <laughs> and putting it, not, not leaving it at work, because it's not getting enough light for it. It might need more light, so I'm gonna put it with, in the same window with this one and see if I can't get it to rebloom again. But again, it needs to be repotted. The roots in this plastic they're container, green color. Yeah. They're, they're green yeah. growing, but most of them are up at the surface here. Right. And I just need to put it in some bark like this has got in okay. it, instead of this sphagnum moss that it, that it came in two years ago. Okay. So, I mean, they've lived in here for two years. It's time to upgrade their living quarters. Yeah, because I'm wondering, somebody's looking at that, they're probably thinking that's root bound. It, it probably is. Okay. It probably is. Now, let's let's just look at this one. I'll okay. I'll probably put another one with this. It's getting ready to bloom. I usually would wait till it finishes blooming, but this one's been really root bound for a long time, wow, and it that. has a lot more roots to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing, I took all the sphagnum moss out of it and got all these nice roots. Of course, I soaked it first, so because they're they're brittle, if you don't soak them first. Okay. And why sphagnum moss? Yeah, that. It's a water holding capacity okay. and makes them moist uh, for shipping and for okay. people to grow. Well, they've lived in it for two years, oh. so they've done very well. Yeah. But I, again, I drain it out. There's, there's not much left in here. It's, I, I usually let it drain out. There's dead roots and stems here oh. that I would get I out, those out of here, because we don't need that. Don't need them at all. Move this. Yeah. And yeah, we just don't need the dead roots and stems on here. Don't need.
need any of that. Oh, it's a lot that was in there. Yeah, it's it's quite a bit. There, you know, it it uh, it latches onto the sides of trees and bark and moss and and it it lives. Okay. But yeah, the and this these it likes air, which is why you don't, you know, drown it too much with water. Watering, over watering and not enough light mm. is probably the number one cause for these not to live okay. after you've bought them. But like I said, this has been living in that little container for two years and it's bloomed for me every year. That's good. So I'll just put some bark in here. Set this plant in here and pour the bark around it. Kind of anchors it in. So what kind of bark are you using? Does it have to be a... This is a special orchid okay. mix bark. It probably allows for good drainage and things like that. It is. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it doesn't have any nutrients yeah. in it. But you, and if you don't get 100% of the roots, that's OK. Uh, it needs air. Yeah. So then I would go ahead and I would water this. I will put this under the faucet and make it sure it's wet, and there it's potted. Hmm. So I mean, it, it probably live in here. This this is a much bigger pot than yeah, it was sure. in. So I'm sure it may never need a container any larger than this. Hmm. Now I would change out the bark occasionally. Okay. Um, I've changed the bark. I've had this one for four years, and I've changed the bark once. Wow. Okay. Uh, but again. I just need to fertilize because <laughs> I've never <laughs> fertilized them. So they really thrive on neglect, except they don't like to be too wet. Just make sure they're, they're not wet and make sure you do water them. Okay. Uh, you'll see the roots will start shriveling and actually the leaves will start shriveling. And that'll be a sign that it really needs water. water. Okay. But you, you want to keep the sphagnum moss uh, you let it dry out between waterings, but then make sure that it does get watered and enough light for it to use all of the okay. nutrients. All right. Yeah. So don't overwater. Mm -mm. Right. Don't, don't overwater. Really give it much. enough light. Yeah, give it enough light. And it'll tell it'll you that, like this one's saying, hey, I've got enough light to live, but I don't have enough light to rebloom. Got it. Got it. All right. Yeah, for those folks who, uh, you know, get these gifts, gifts uh, get them yeah. from the store, yeah. now they know how to take care of them. Yes. Well, thank you, Joel. I appreciate that. you All right. It's easy to be attracted to beautiful flowering baskets for summer color. Amanda Villa is a great choice for it. It's a long season of flower with low maintenance. Watering is a real challenge for being successful with these hanging baskets often because they can dry out very quickly. Uh, use your finger if you can reach the basket to test if that soil is starting to dry out. Then water it again and water thoroughly. Let it drain out of the bottom. Uh, if it's too high and you can't reach it, try lifting it with a broomstick to tell when it's light, it's thirsty, uh, when it's heavy, that it probably doesn't need any more water. Also, as the season changes and you have more foliage and it gets hotter, you might need to have more water to it. And in reverse, as the days become shorter and nights begin to cool as we get toward fall, you may need to reduce those watering needs. Also, remember that if you're doing that much watering in this small container, a good little fertilizer boost midsummer would be a great thing to do. All right, Tanya, let's talk a little bit about beneficial bugs. But first, what do we mean by beneficial? Well, a beneficial bug or beneficial insect is a, a bug that helps you reach your goals in the garden. Mm -hmm. Some of them are pollinators. We think of immediately our, our bees that are good pollinators, so they're beneficial to us. And also we have a lot of bugs that kill other bugs that we don't like. Okay. So um, we have bugs that eat the bugs that would eat our vegetables. Okay. So you want to start with the braconid wasp? Sure. Right. Um, the braconid wasp is very a common thing to be seen in the garden, but most people don't know when they've seen uh, evidence of the mm -hmm. braconid wasp. Usually you'll find these on tom tomato hornworms sure. on your tomato plants. You'll see all these little white egg sacs mm -hmm. on the back of the caterpillar and the braconid wasp, even though it's a wasp, it will not sting you. They're very tiny, like a, 
an eighth of an inch, so very small. The female lays her eggs on the back of caterpillars, mm. moths, um, beetle larvae, and some aphids. And when those eggs hatch, the larvae eat the host, the tomato hornworm or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then um, after they are done eating, the bad bug dies and the <laughs> beneficial, the new beneficials fly away to infect more of your pests. So if you see a tom tomato hornworm that has all of these little white egg sacs on the back, you don't want to mm -hmm. squish it. Um, you want to leave it there so that it can um, provide food for those good bugs. You can also attract them in your garden by growing certain things like dill, parsley, okay. wild carrot, and yarrow. Um, in general, any kind of little, a little herb with small flowers, uh, those the adult wasps like to use for nectar. Wow, small flowers. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh-huh. Okay. Now let's talk uh, about green lacewing. Okay. The green lacewing, um, the larvae are the ones that feed on the pests in this okay. case. They like aphids, mealybugs, caterpillars, scales, thrip, and whiteflies. So a lot, a lot of the things yeah. that we don't like, they like to munch on. Yeah. The female will lay her eggs on a slender egg stalk and she can lay about 200 eggs at a time yeah. on, these, on these stalks. And one larva that emerges from that will eat 200 aphids in a week. So they're called aphid lines. They're really hungry, <laughs> hungry guys. In a week. In a week, 200 oh, aphids. And Amazing. they will feed for two to three weeks before they go into a cocoon and then five days later they emerge. Okay. Um, you can plant some things to attract them to your garden like Angelica, Coreopsis, Cosmos, and Sweet Alyssum. And you can also mail order those egg stalks with the, the eggs. Okay. Um, so yeah, the green lace wing uh, are very beneficial. You don't want to, you don't want to spray those with an insecticide. And in fact, um, a good rule of thumb is, you know, when you spray an insecticide, you oftentimes kill the beneficials with the ones that you're trying to get rid of. Good so, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, unless you use BT because it's specific to caterpillars, but good. if you use a broad spectrum insecticide, you're gonna kill all of your good with your bad. So you want to be careful in how you use those. Good information to share, Tanya. Good information. How about this next one though, a pirate bug? Yes, How about that? minute pirate bugs. Yeah. Kind of a fun name. Yeah, that's pretty um, fun. They're very small, uh, a twelfth to a fifth of an inch long. That's where they get the minute from. Yeah, very small. small, and they're black and white in color. The immature stages are um, very small. They're kind of teardrop shaped and brown and orangey colored. The adults and the nymphs will both. Um, be predators for thrips, spider mites, aphids, and their eggs. Mm. And an adult will eat 30 spider mites a day. So um, they're quick moving. They'll attack just about anything though, not just those particular pests that we like to get rid of. And the way they um, attack their prey is they have a piercing sucking mouth part. Mm. So they'll use that mouth part to inject into their prey and then they will suck the juices out of the prey. Yee. Yuck, but that's how <laughs> they do it. Um, they can go from an egg to adult in three weeks, and they have three generations per season. And this is another one that you can buy online. Okay. Um, and they're actually a really good uh, predatory bug if you've got a greenhouse, and they may be more effective than, than others. And if you want to try to just encourage them to come to your garden, you can plant goldenrod, daisies, mm -hmm. um, alfalfa, yarrow, mm -hmm. clover, and veg. Okay. All right, so how about the praying mantis? We've all heard about the yeah. praying mantis. Well, the praying mantis are really cool they looking bugs. Cool. Um, of course, they get their names from their big front legs mm -hmm. that they use to grab their prey while they munch. And they can be um, really good at camouflaging themselves against mm -hmm. twigs and sticks and all that kind of stuff. They like to um, lay their egg cases in like this paper mache looking mm -hmm. thing. Um, actually, bought a tree recently and it had one of these oh, egg cases okay. on it so that was pretty cool. pretty cool and the egg case will have like up to 200 baby praying mantis in wow. there okay. and you won't even know that they've hatched you can't tell the difference when it when um you can't look at the egg case and tell if they've hatched or not you just have to happen to see a baby praying <laughs> mantis somewhere and that's how you know that you've had a hatch wow. so you can buy them on the internet and put them in a greenhouse or in a garden setting, but you won't know if they've hatched or not unless you just so happen to see the babies. And these take five months to mature, and um, they can lay up to five egg cases in their lifetime. 
and they like to eat pretty much anything that will catch their attention. They're pretty slow moving and um, yeah, so they'll grab anything, like another beneficial insect even, they'll oh. grab, like bees and other oh. praying mantis. So they're not real particular on what they eat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's pretty tough. I've never seen a baby one, though. Have I you? haven't either, except uh -huh. like on the internet. Um, you can like look up okay. video of these things hatching out of their egg case. It's oh. really pretty cool. All right. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah. So once again... Folks, be careful when you're using pesticides mm -hmm. in the garden, right? Because we do have beneficials out there that will help us, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Thank you much for that good information, Tony. We Thanks. appreciate that. We're here in the garden with one of the staple crops of the Mid-South Garden, and that is the beautiful okra plant. We have a few blooms here that are just past gorgeous bloom, but I think one of the most important and sometimes misunderstood elements in growing okra is when exactly do we need to harvest these fruit? Oftentimes what we'll say is when they're two to three inches long. And so we have a good example here of a, a growing fruit here that is of course too small, too small. This could actually be a really nice size tender for harvesting. Pretty quickly they will uh, get a little bit larger than would be ideal. They might get a little bit tougher. We can see here's a little bit too large for harvest. Some other larger fruit back there. It's important to keep a close eye on the fruit so that you pick at just the right interval to keep them young and tender. Every couple of days should be able to get you in the range of picking just the right stage as opposed to over mature. All right, Joel, and here's our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. Oh, these are some good questions we have here. Good. All right, here's our first viewer email. I think you'll like this one. How do I rejuvenate and fortify my Stella Deora daylilies to keep them thriving and reblooming? Mm -hmm. I have some in containers and others in the ground. Thank you, and this is Barbara. So the old Stella Deora oh, daylilies yes. that you've taught us so much oh, about. Oh yes, I, I love Stella Deoras. They they like all kinds of conditions: yeah. dry, wet. They do well everywhere. Um, you know, they they are reblooming. I usually only mm -hmm. get two blooms a season. They do not like heat. That's the problem. <laughs> so in the heat of the summer, they, they, don't, they don't do anything. Right. But now, I, you know, like all perennials, if you deadhead the seed uh -huh. heads on top, about that. Okay. Yeah, they will more likely come to bloom again faster because it's not what is, a whole plant's purpose is to reproduce, so mm -hmm. it, if you cut off that, they think, oh, I have to bloom again to produce more seeds. Right. Uh, other parts of the country that don't get as hot, anything that reblooms still needs a downtime to then get enough energy to rebloom again. Got it. So you will always have pauses and periods of it. But here we only get two blooms a season because of the heat. Yeah. And my, she, you know, I don't know where she's at, but yeah. she might get more. And if she deadhead them, deadheads them, then they, she might get them the bloom again faster. She might, yeah. That's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, yeah, they will put a lot of their energy into seeds. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, would you consider fertilizing? I have not fertilized mine. Uh, I would you consider don't. I, perennials yeah. don't need that much fertilizer, yeah. no. And you're going to cause more foliage than, right. and you would. Plants will, if they think they're not going to live very long. They'll tend to want to put out flowers and seeds. So, you know, the more they're a little stressed, the better they'll probably bloom. Okay. Better they probably bloom. All right. But do deadhead. But yeah, they mm -hmm. are beautiful. They are okay. pretty. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Miss Barbara, for that question. Mm -hmm. thought Joella might like that one. Mm -hmm. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have a rose bush with black spot. How can I treat it? Does the soil need to be treated? Or should I just remove the rose altogether? Thank you. And this is Barbara from New York. Oh, wow. All right. So she knows the rose bush mm -hmm. has black spots. Yeah. Common, very common disease. Uh, and of we roses. probably see more of it here oh, than yeah. she does there because our weather is so humid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She probably sees it less there. And maybe she's not had a problem with it before. Maybe. And you know, I would say air circulation, we go yeah. for environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. Has it grown there for several years? Has there other shrubs that have grown near it? Other roses, the rose itself? Does it need to be thinned from a better air yep. circulation? Mm -hmm. 
to reduce the chances of black spot. But yes, you can treat that with fungicides. You can treat it with a fungicide. A couple of things. Practice good sanitation. Yeah, yes. get those leaves up, of course, because they do harbor uh, fungal spores. You definitely want to do the air circulation. Is something we talked about. Uh, how about resistant varieties? Let's oh, look yeah, at uh, yeah. let's Definitely. look at some of those uh, resistant varieties, right? Mm -hmm. And think about the soil as this, you know, down in our area. I mean, yeah, those fungal spores could probably be there for about a month. Yeah. You know, and then of course they you know go ahead and go away. Um, but up in New York, like as you mentioned, mm -hmm. yeah, the zone's yeah, a little right. different. The climate's going to be a little different. But yeah, our heat, humidity, because water spreads this disease, yes. this fungal disease. Water, irrigation, and does she people. And mulch on the top. Right, and that's something else too. You know, yep. because the soils are so good up there, sometimes they don't right. use mulch. That's right. So yeah, I would put a mulch layer down to keep the spores right. from, then, from jumping yeah, from the soil onto Yeah, get that splashing effect. Yeah, exactly right, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, if you do those things, Ms. Barbara, we think you'd be fine. And then of course, if you have to use a fungicide, there's some fungicides out there. Uh, Daconil is one, a copper-based fungicide will be another one yeah. uh, that you can use. Just read and follow the label on that. Uh, but cultural practices is what we always like to talk about first. Sure. Right. So again, to get air circulation, uh, look at the resistant varieties, mulch, mulch. you know, uh, will be good mm -hmm. as well. So we appreciate yeah. that question. And that way you can enjoy your rose bush. Yes. Don't get rid of it. No, no. Uh -uh. Don't get rid of it. All right, Joel. It's good. Yes, it's it was. Good. Thank you much. Thank uh -huh. you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about caring for orchids, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.